Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and today we're starting a new series called Why Rockets Fail. I've wanted to go into the history and backstory behind many rocket failures because there's a lot of them out there and they aren't just happening today. There's great ones from history. And so I want to go back to one that it was you know, for, in the forefront of my mind last year when I was watching the last Delta II flight. On January 17th, 1997, a Delta II rocket lifted off from Launch Complex 17A at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. It was carrying GPS 2R1, the first of a new series of GPS satellites intended to enhance the cluster. The launch vehicle had been configured to use nine strap-on solid rocket motors, the largest configuration used on this workhorse rocket, with six of them being lit at launch and then three of them being lit later during the ascent. However, at T plus 13 seconds and a height of about 1600 feet or 500 meters, the vehicle exploded with spectacular consequences. The showering debris fell into the surrounding areas and some of the debris was burning chunks of solid propellant from the Gem 40 motors, which continued to burn, starting fires all around the launch site and perhaps most impressively, destroying a large numbers of cars parked next to the blockhouse. As rocket failures go, it was one of the more spectacular. The explosion happened low enough that the vehicle hadn't turned out over the ocean, but yet high enough that the debris was able to spread across a very large area. The crew in the blockhouse were right in the middle of it and they ended up having to don respirators because smoke from the burning fuel was leaking in through various cable conduits. As it happened, this would be the last Delta launch controlled from the launch center blockhouse. The Delta II would be the modern evolution of the Delta series of rockets, which in turn were evolved from the Thor Intermediate Range Ballistic Missile, developed by the Douglas Aircraft Company. Now, the Thor had been an intermediate range ballistic missile that was designed to be a stopgap interim solution, while they were also developing the much more complex Atlas. The Delta had a single engine, it had a single stage, and that meant that it had a much shorter range, and to be an effective weapon meant that it had to be deployed in the UK. Because of this, it had been designed to be transportable by aircraft, giving it a diameter of 2.4 metres and a length of only 20 metres. As a weapon, it had a short career, but as those missiles were returned to the US, they began being converted into launch vehicles. And so Thor became Delta, and by the 1990s, it was evolved into the Delta II. Over those intervening years, it had been modified to keep up with the heavier and heavier payloads. The tanks had been stretched, the main engine had been upgraded, a second stage had been added, and the thrust augmented Delta is the first example of a rocket using strap-on solid rocket boosters to help get it off the ground. The specific model of the Delta II used in the GPS launch was a Delta II 7925-9.5. So the 7 indicated that it was the 7000 series, incorporating an upgraded RS-27A engine and new carbon fibre cased solid rocket motors. The 9 indicated that it was using 9 of those motors, with 6 lit on the ground and 3 lit in flight. The 2 specified that the engine on this upper stage was an AJ-10 engine, and the 5 indicated that the third stage had a payload assist module, which uh, was in the form of a Star 48 solid rocket motor. Finally, the 9.5 indicated that it used the 9.5 foot wide payload fairing. It was common that the payload fairings on the GPS satellites would include the shark teeth design as a tribute to, of course, the famous Flying Tigers. This whole stack would have massed about 230 tons and was about 40 meters tall. The Delta II 6000 series had used Castor 4A solid rocket motors with metal casings, but the 7000 series had switched to newer carbon fiber cased Gem 40s. So that's a graphite epoxy motor and the 40 is 40 inch diameter. These were longer, they were more powerful, they burned longer and they get better specific impulse. And those were the root of this most spectacular rocket failure.
Solid rocket motors are just about the simplest kind of engine used in rocket design. With the early deltas, they were added on the outside to add extra thrust to the core stage during launch, but they've since become a standard part, being used, of course, in the Delta II, Delta IV, the Atlas, and the Vulcan, and many more. Now, the design is very, very simple. You essentially have a bunch of solid propellant which burns inside, and then the, that is constrained by the pressure vessel, which is uh, the exterior. Inside here, the rocket fuel is burning with fierce intensity. It is essentially exploding and being forced to explode out the back, out of a rocket nozzle. Now, inside this, there are really high pressures and really high temperatures. The Castor 4 would have pressures of about 46 atmospheres, whereas the Gem 40s were up about 56 atmospheres. And of course, this pressure vessel that's holding it together is critical. It has to handle all that pressure and all the other flight loads. The Gem 40s were an upgrade because they were slightly longer and they were also able to hold more pressure, make a stronger, theoretically a stronger pressure vessel by using composite materials. Photos from a journalist captured a crack developing in the casing of the number two booster about seven seconds after ignition. The split quickly grew from 30 centimetres long to 100 centimetres long over the next five seconds, and then the entire casing failed catastrophically. The disintegration was so violent that it ruptured the casing of a neighbouring solid rocket motor and also triggered the self-destruct system in the booster about 40 milliseconds later, with a total elapsed mission time of 12.58 seconds. Despite this violence, the second stage and payload continued upwards for another 10 seconds or so, bringing its altitude to about 750 metres, and then somebody in the blockhouse actually sent the self-destruct signal, destroying the uh, second stage. However, the payload apparently remained relatively intact inside its fairing until, of course, it fell back to Earth with a bang. But of course, there were many other things falling back to Earth at that time. Over 2,000 fragments of the rocket, with most of them being burning chunks of solid fuel called firebrands. Uh, these, of course, landed all over, hitting three other space launch complex. Uh, near to the launch site, 72 cars and other vehicles were affected, with 26 of them being completely destroyed. Debris landed in the Space Museum and damaged their uh, Titan I display, and appropriately, the Thor display. Thankfully, and perhaps miraculously, nobody was hurt with this spectacular display. But the totality of the destruction left the investigators with a difficult job to determine why a booster had come unzipped under pressure. After many months, their report concluded that the casing had likely been damaged during testing and handling. The Air Force found that during hydrostatic pressure tests, the casing could reach up to 95% of its ultimate tensile strength, and that this might have weakened the structure in a way that wasn't evident to visual inspection. There's this nice experiment where you they demonstrate the ultimate tensile strength of a composite material, and a microphone can actually pick up little plink plink sounds of individual fibres inside the material breaking under tension, and as they break, the load shifts to other fibres which also subsequently break. But the material weakens as this is held, this tension is held. So a test which pushes the material near to its ultimate limit but doesn't break it, will weaken it significantly in the process. Ultimately, the testing, inspection and loading procedures were all changed to accommodate this, and they added ultrasonic inspections of the casing to catch any damage which may not be e evident to the human eye. And it worked. After this catastrophic moment, Delta II continued to fly with the same graphite epoxy motors, and it had no more problems. In fact, the next 100 launches would all be successful, right up to the final ISAT-2 launch last year. And I'm going to say, when my car had technical problems while parked next to that booster on the pad, I'll admit that I had a few visions of those burnt-out husks of cars at, Na at uh, Cape Canaveral. But truthfully, I was more worried about getting my car out of the way so they could launch this historic rocket for the final time. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.